welcome back to Ostrich Investing. You probably thought I was going to take the rest of 2020 off. No way. Uh, today we're back. Uh, we're back in a big way. And we're going to talk about a company that's in a sector that's just slightly out of favor. We're going to talk about Suncor. So before we jump into it, it's uh, Canadian Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, the channel just hit a thousand subscribers. So thanks to everyone for watching and following along. It's been a lot of fun. I uh, hope everyone enjoys a uh, great Thanksgiving weekend in Canada. And if you're watching from somewhere else in the world, hope you have a great weekend as well. So Suncor is one of Canada's largest and best known blue chip integrated oil producers. And it's, it's been a tough sector. Uh, every time you think it can't get worse for oil and gas producers, it finds a way to get worse. You know, think about shale production over the last five plus years, environmental concerns and the move to clean energy. Saudi and Russia earlier this year, um, <laughs> taking the floor out from underneath oil prices. And then, of course, COVID, which has been a which has seen a huge um, drop in demand, at least in the short term here for for oil. So highlights of Suncor, uh, it's a diversified producer with both, both upstream and downstream assets. Uh, and downstream has historically provided stability to cash flow. So we'll talk about that a little bit. It's also free cash flow positive despite the weak environment. Um, it's got a re reduced dividend from earlier this year. It slashed its dividend in half. But because the share price has performed so poorly, um, even the reduced dividend now represents 5% yield at current levels wh while you wait. And it's also got an investment grade credit rating uh, with, uh, and this stat is obviously very misleading, but 1.5 times debt to FFO based on 2019 uh, funds from operations. So uh, this video will explore if shares of Suncor are attractive or if this is a sector that should simply be avoided. And disclosure, uh, I felt a little bit squeamish when I did it, uh, but I bought shares of Suncor just a little over a week ago, uh, right at the end of September at, a, at about 1660. Uh, and I think it's also important to, to point out that that's my only individual oil and gas producer in my portfolio. So I don't, I don't have a whole bunch of these. Uh, I do own the Canadian Index, uh, which obviously has a, a meaningful energy weighting or used to anyway. Uh, but yeah, I do own Suncor. Let's jump into it. So the business, it's it's the largest or the second largest now. I think CNQ just just took it over in terms of market cap um, producer in Canada, and it has very large operations. Namely, you know, key key assets for Suncor are up in the oil sands, where they've got twenty nine year oil sand reserve life. Um, they've also got. EMP production assets off the coast in St. John, so Eastern Canada, as well as over in the UK. And then they've also got downstream assets. So that includes uh, refining capacity, uh, about 460,000 barrels of per day of refining capacity. And that's across Canada, both Western Canada, Eastern Canada, and they've got a refinery in Colorado here. Uh, and then they've got close to 2000 gas stations, basically, uh, across the country. Uh, and you can see here they've pointed out with the red dots that they've uh, got a coast-to-coast -coast electric vehicle charging network. So something with their gas station network, they're, um, they're moving into the electrification of vehicles and, and being a part of that. So those are the key assets for Suncor. And in 2019, they delivered uh, close to almost 800,000 barrels a day of oil production. How's the share price done? Um, not well. So you can see that in January of 2020, and, and reminder here, seems like a lifetime ago, WTI was about $60 a barrel. Suncor was kind of in that $45 range, you know, somewhere between $40 and $45 a share. Um, and uh, you can see the volume. Uh, they've really turned the volume up and the share price down here. Uh, but a lot of turnover in shares of Suncor through both um, what happened to oil prices after Saudi and Russia, and then uh, particularly uh, with COVID. As a result of that, Suncor is trading at close to 20-year lows. This is a five-year chart, and you can see sort of a high of $55 here, 
Uh, low is kind of where it is now, 1650-ish. Um, but you have to go back to 2003 to get back to similar share price for, for Suncor. Financials, talk about a little bit more on the next slide, but just their five-year history that they show in their annual report. You can see revenue growing from about 30 billion in 2015 to almost 40 billion in 2019. And then you've got the profitability by segment. Now you can look at funds from operations, which we'll do later. You can also just look at net earnings. Um, and you can see that historically uh, on a consolidated basis, Suncor has been profitable. You go back to 2015, which was a very bad year for oil and gas. You can see negative, negative 2 billion of net earnings. You can see 2.7 of that in corporate and eliminations, which was likely a, um, a write down of some of their assets that year. But you can see by and large profitable business, uh, growing revenue, um, and then funds from operations have also increased uh, meaningfully over five years from you know six, six to seven billion dollars in 15 and 16 to a little over 10 billion. And just taking a bit of a deeper look, uh, so here's revenue, just in bar chart form. You can see what they've done with production. So production ended 2019 at 777,000 barrels per day, uh, and that's been climbing steadily uh, from 578,000 uh, barrels per day in 2015. And you can see significant CapEx investment, which has been driving that production growth. So over here on the bottom left, CapEx of well over $6 billion in each of 2015, 2016, and 2017. And you could see in 18 and 19, CapEx was starting to come off. And that was a big part of the story. So I say below, the free cash flow story was emerging at Suncor in 2018, excuse me, in 2019, uh, where they had, they had spent significant CapEx in years prior. Now they've built up these long life reserves in the oil sands, production growth is there, and they're gonna benefit from the free cash flow. And so that's the, the chart on the bottom right, where if you take their funds from operations, you net out the CapEx, that gets you the free cash flow. And so you can see in 2015 and 16, free cash flow was flat to slightly negative, but really started to pick up in the last two to three years. And uh, the company delivered over 5 billion of free cash flow just last year. And I've layered in the average WTI price for the year just, just so that you can, you can see the different pricing environments by year. 2020, it's a different story in 2020 and it goes without saying, but we're gonna say it anyway. 2020 has been a challenging year for oil producers and that includes Suncor. Uh, so Suncor cut the dividend in May 2020 by 55% down to 84 cents a year. In addition to the weak oil prices, WTI, I mean, I mean, it went negative, uh, everyone remembers that, uh, but really, you know, WTI in that 35 to 40 range uh, on average this year, that compares to coming into the year around $60. Um, Suncor also had a fire at its oil sand operations and reduced production uh, in its oil sands operation through the balance of the year. Despite all of this, Suncor will likely generate positive free cash flow in 2020. Um, and you can see their most recent guidance here. We'll just highlight a few things. Um, so CapEx, they've, they've cut CapEx. They've made some, some cost cutting as well. Uh, CapEx likely to come in at about 3.8 billion. Production here for the year is expected to come in at about 700,000 barrels a day which is off from 777,000 in 2019. So production is down. Uh, and then refinery utilization is another thing that we'll talk about later. Uh, it's also down uh, relative to prior years. So despite all of this, and, and it might be close, um, but Suncor will likely generate positive free cash flow in 2020. Okay, so talk a little bit about the downstream assets, which is I think one of the key differentiators for Suncor. Historically, if you go back over the last five years, and again, you can find this chart in the annual report uh, right at the back, 
uh, right after all the notes. Refining and marketing. So again, the, the, the refining operations and the gas stations basically have delivered really consistent, I'm showing earnings here, but it earnings and cash flow. So 2 billion in 2015, almost 2 billion in 2016, increasing to just over 3 billion in the last few years, but it's been nice and steady, um, which is, uh, I think, a key differentiator for Suncor. Now, if you look at the utilization of refining capacity, it's in the 90s. And I'm not an expert on on refineries or that side of the business, but one thing you do read about is that um, they're profitable when they're highly utilized, so when the cap capacity is up. And I think it's important to point out at the Q2 press release that um, you know refining capacity is actually down this year. Uh, and you can see in the second quarter, it was at 76%. So here, here's their comment in the Q2 press release. Refining and marketing recorded 475 million funds from operations in Q2. Refinery, refinery utilization averaged 76% in Q2, which was achieved during a period of significant volatility. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, we expect util utilization rates of greater than 85% exiting the quarter. So long story short, if you take 475, you multiply that by four quarters, um, that's a little bit less profitable than normal. Um, but they do expect to see improvement on the refining side um, going forward. And key takeaways, historically, these assets have provided nice earnings and cash flow stability. Okay, what about the upstream? So on the upstream side, you, you've got the oil sands, which is the vast majority of, of the production. And you've got the EMP side, which is Again, offshore in the East Coast of Canada and UK assets. So if we look at the oil sands first on the, uh, the bar chart on the left side, I've, just, I've showed free cash flow for the oil sands assets. And the takeaway here is that significant capex has driven oil sands production growth of 45% in five years. And you can see that here. So in 2015, production of 463,000 barrels per day in 2019, that had reached 670,000 barrels per day. It is not super low cost production. The cash cost per barrel is about $30 Canadian, uh, which is an important distinction because we always think about WTI, which is priced in US dollars. Okay, uh, and then I guess just to close out here, you can see the free cash flow profile improving and the oil sands assets generated two and a half billion in free cash flow last year. On the EMP side, these are actually really nice low cost assets. So steady production, um, UK and the East Coast, but uh, delivering strong free cash flow. Net backs here uh, are $60 plus per barrel uh, Canadian. So you can see production here, 114,000 barrels a day. 107,000 barrels a day in 2019, so more or less uh, stable, but very nice cash flowing, free cash flowing assets. So that's the upstream side. And I guess we need to talk a little bit about the sector. Uh, so supply and demand for, for oil and gas, there's lots of places to read about this, but I'll at least touch on it in the video. What do we know? We know that with COVID, global demand has dropped from 100 million barrels a day, roughly. Um, and more or less, people think that the average across 2020 is going to be about 90 million barrels a day, so down significantly. Uh, OPEC came out with a, uh, their forecast, I think just in the last week here, and came out with their proje projections. and. We all know about the move to clean energy, electrification of vehicles, and you can see this chart, and this is from the Wall Street Journal, but it comes from, from OPEC's uh, report. They forecasted out to 2045, and you can see that OPEC nations, they anticipate production or demand to drop off from where it is currently at close to 50 million barrels a day down to about 35 million barrels a day by 2045. Now OPEC does believe, however, that emerging markets, uh, think India, China, will 
will offset um, that reduction in demand. And so net net, they see oil demand going flat to slightly higher over the medium medium to long term here. The other thing we need to think about is the last five years have been pretty tough for the sector and there the lack of investments uh, we know that shale assets have high decline rates and that uh, several of those players are in restructuring right now or having credit difficulties we know for sure that banks aren't excited about extending new credit uh, into this sector so supply could actually decrease uh, in the coming years which would be uh, very helpful from a a supply demand balance and, and getting uh, getting pricing uh, getting a nice floor under pricing and maybe a little bit of a uh, little bit of upside and then here this chart on the bottom right just uh, again from OPEX report shows the composition of global vehicle fleet uh, out to 2045 and the orange it's gonna be small on your screen here but the orange is full electric vehicles and then they've got these other colors are sort of hybrids and natural gas vehicles. But I guess long story short is OPEC, and you got to take that um, with a grain of salt, doesn't see, you know, full electrification of the global. So not, not just North America here, we're talking global uh, fleet through uh, 2045. And we know that um, vehicles are a big source of demand for oil. Uh, but Something to ask as an investor, have we seen peak oil demand? Is 100% electric, electric vehicle penetration coming? Uh, these are the sorts of uh, things that are being discussed. And if you look at the share prices of these oil and gas companies, these are the types of narratives that seem to be winning right now. So uh, demand concerns, both short-term and long-term, weigh on the sector. Balance sheet for Suncor, uh, is fairly strong. So while they do have a meaningful amount of debt relative to the size of the business, um, Suncor has pretty strong liquidity. And I think they've moved quickly to protect liquidity. So between the cost cutting, um, slashing their CapEx budget, and they were also quick to cut their dividend, um, they want to make sure that they maintain a strong balance sheet and management's come out and said that on conference calls. So this is just from their investor presentation. I'll go through a few of the highlights, but investment grade credit rating, nine billion of liquidity, including close to two billion of cash, debt to capitalization, 37.5%. Uh, so just at the high end of the range, but the covenant doesn't kick in to 65%. And then net debt to FFO, they don't actually give you the number here. We calculated it as one and a half on, on 2019. Obviously 2020 is gonna be a little uglier than that. And then the, the real question is, what do you think 2021 looks like? Comparables. So before we get into key drivers for the stock and our bull bear and base case scenario, I wanted to just position Suncor versus a few other potential investments you could make in the space and sort of how I was thinking about it. So again, we've talked about Suncor has a diversified business model relative to most producers. Um, there are other integrated players in Canada I haven't put on the screen here. Imperial Oil would be one of them. I think it offers better risk reward to Enbridge. Now we've talked about Enbridge uh, on the channel before and, and you wouldn't normally stack up Suncor, Canadian Natural, Whitecap and Enbridge all on the same slide. Enbridge is different, right? It, it does pipelines. But you know when you think about the challenges in the sector and basically that we've we've seen peak oil demand and uh it's going to be a struggle from here on out and basically the death of the the oil and gas sector um to me both suncor and enbridge are significantly impaired in those scenarios uh enbridge's pipelines aren't going to be worth too much if there's no product uh being produced and being shipped on those lines and so you know in that scenario they're both kind of in trouble uh, otherwise, I think you've got a lot more upside uh, as an investor with Suncor, and we'll get to that uh, in, a, in a few slides, but I think you could quite easily see 100 to 200% upside with Suncor. In fact, it was trading almost 200% higher 
just in early January of this year. Whereas I think if things go well, Enbridge share price is also depressed, but maybe you get 50% upside. So again, up to everyone, uh, individual risk tolerance, but that was just sort of an interesting uh, thought that I had when I was trying to figure out which, which company I might invest in in the broader energy space in Canada. So we'll go through the rest of this relatively quickly. Suncor, it's obviously a large player, enterprise value close to 50 billion, 20 plus years of reserves. Um, Canadian Natural, also large, a little bit larger than Suncor, also 20 plus year of reserves. In fact, you know, to me, I was quite impressed with CNQ when I, when I went through and did my research it was uh, right up there, and, and in fact, you know, they've got, uh, and I'm jumping around here, but they've got, oil, they've also got some some meaningful gas assets, which Suncor doesn't, uh, but Suncor has the downstream assets, so that's ultimately why I went with Suncor. But CNQ looked to me like an attractive uh, investment opportunity as well. They're a little lower cost producer than Suncor, uh, so they've got a slight cost advantage as well. Whereas White Cap. It's midsize, uh, two and a half billion EV, not quite as long reserve. I haven't looked at this in a while, but I think the last time I checked, it was sort of 10 plus years. Um, and it's upstream oil and liquids focused. And then we know Enbridge, super large, 160 billion EV, uh, lots of debt, uh, lots of market cap too. Uh, pipeline business model. If you look at the dividend, they all offer attractive dividends, 5% for Suncor, which again, that was cut by 55% in 2020, um, and it's still offering a 5% dividend. Canadian Natural did not cut. Their yield is 7%, white cap 7%, and that's after a cut in 2020. And then Enbridge, which is offering 8% yield, uh, which is kind of unheard of for a pipeline like Enbridge, um, and they have not cut it, at least uh, not yet. Leverage debt. Um, 2.3 times debt to FFO based on, you know, a, a research consensus for 2021. Uh, <clears throat> 2.5 times debt to FFO for 2021 for CNQ. So similar leverage profiles. White cap, uh, a little bit lower, two times. And Enbridge, we're looking at debt to EBITDA here. Obviously higher leverage in, in Enbridge's business, but much more stability, uh, at least in the near term. And then valuation, Suncor, CNQ, not much to choose from here. Uh, about five and a half times EV to debt adjusted cash flow. Again, looking out 2021. White cap's a little bit cheaper, uh, under four times EV to debt adjusted cash flow for 2021. And then Enbridge, 13 times EV to EBITDA. So I guess to just close out this slide, and we've spent a bit of time uh, on it, but you know, white cap for me is a little bit higher risk. Um, yes, it's a little bit cheaper, but when a sector is so beat up, uh, to me, I would rather go with a play that I think is a little bit more stable, has a little bit more downside protection and maybe 200% upside versus 300% if I could put it that way. So yes, white cap, very cheap, but, it, but the reason why I went with Suncor is I'd like to sort of have as much, uh, downside protection as possible. So anyway, that's enough on this slide, but uh, just a few of my thoughts and looking at some of the other energy uh, options in Canada. So here we go, key considerations, strengths. Uh, Suncor, we've talked about this, integrated business model provides cash flow stability, has significant historical investment uh, over the years, we saw you know six billion plus in capex year upon year upon year, uh, and that's given them a long reserve life up in the oil sands. Um, so a lot of the money's already been spent; they've got the assets now. Their free cash flow break even is is down to U.S. thirty five dollar WTI. So oil prices currently around forty dollars a barrel. Uh, that works. I mean, obviously, you'd love to see prices higher. Uh, but they can go down to $35 WTI. At least that's what's management. That's what management is telling you, um, and break even from a free cash flow perspective. And they've got an investment grade balance sheet, and the company's moved quickly. I think we have to give them credit there. 
On the risk side, uh, the sector decreasing demand for oil, uh, both short and long term. So in the short short term, COVID's had a huge impact. There's oversupply uh, because you just can't cut off the production fast enough. Uh, and then in the long term, we know of the structural shift that's going to move away from oil and gas and into more renewable sources. Key question is how long does that take? And will that mean meaningful reduction in oil demand? Or when you pair that with global population growth, et cetera, will that just mean that oil demand growth will, will flatten? Uh, so that's really, you know, that's the big argument here is you, where do you stand in terms of long-term uh, demand for oil. Another risk is Suncor is not the lowest cost producer. So another way you could try and do here, you know, if you're looking to invest in the space right now is try and find the lowest cost producer and go there. That's not Suncor. Uh, again, we talked about cash costs in Canadian dollars of about $30 a barrel for the oil sands. Uh, so not bad, but definitely not low cost producer. Political headwinds, I'm a Canadian, got to talk about it, particularly in Canada. Um, the oil sands, they have a bad rap. Um, you can agree or disagree with it, but they do. Um, and in Canada, you see all of the stimulus that's been announced by our Liberal government. None of it is geared towards oil and gas. It, it almost, it's like a, it's like a swear word. They don't want to use it in, in their announcements. So you have to know that as an investor and just know that in Canada right now, there isn't any love for the space politically. And, and then from investor standpoint, there's been significant funds flows out of the oil sector and the focus on ESG. Uh, and when we, if you go back to that stock price chart we showed at the beginning of that volume uh, in, in the shares being turned over this year is a big sign of that and and money has definitely been leaving the sector so key drivers oil pricing supply demand absolutely no surprise there um, that's going to be a big dictator for Suncor and if you again if you think back to the charts that we showed uh, you could see when WTI is in that 50 to 60 dollar range they're generating significant free cash flow operational performance you know they had a fire at their oil sand assets uh, this year, we shouldn't just take it for granted that everything runs absolutely uh, smoothly. That's going to be uh, a key for Suncor. And then the refining margins, you know, making sure that the downstream assets continue to produce, you know, call it $3 billion of cash flow for the business annually. So bull, base, and bear case scenarios. On the bull side, We'll call it, and I'm going to talk a lot in ranges here because when you get, my view is when a sector is so beaten up, you can have a really fine point on your pen when you're doing analysis in terms of, uh, in terms of what the outcomes will be. But the truth is this is a really unloved sector. So there's a bit of psychology that goes into it as well. So bull case is $60 plus WTI, we call it that. And demand recovery and supply constraints given the lack of spending in recent years. We've got higher pricing. It drives significant free cash flow to producers, in, including Suncor, but those producers are also still hesitant and maybe a bit gun shy to quickly ramp up CapEx. The, the banks and, and the creditors may also be hesitant to lend for them to quickly ramp up as well, but this is kind of the perfect scenario where demand recovers. We have the supply constraints that people have been talking about. And as the WTI price improves, uh, the producers aren't super quick to, uh, to invest in, in CapEx and increase in production growth. So you'll actually have a reasonable period of time uh, with good pricing. I do think on the bull side, it's important to point out that, you know, maybe, never say never, but I think the days of 80, 90, $100 oil are probably over. The shale production, while we know it's high decline rate, it can be turned on um, and it's not like the oil's disappeared. And so I think, you know, I don't know what the right number is in terms of oil price, but there's a certain price where it will become extremely attractive and that additional production will get will get turned on. So in, in my view, I think about $60 plus would love to see higher, higher oil prices, um, but I, I don't 
think it's super realistic. So what does that get us to? Honestly, there's, there's really no, there's no method to my madness here other than looking at, excuse me, roughly the cash flows that, that Suncor generated in, in that type of pricing environment, as well as where the share price traded in that pricing environment. Again, you could take a finer point in it. I thought about, you know, uh, doing a bunch of calculations, but the truth is, I think, I think it's a bit of a waste of time. I think it's as simple as in a better pricing environment, $45 a share plus is, is, is very reasonable. Base case, this is more range bound. So we're a little over $40 a barrel today. We kind of stay in that 40 to 50 space. Oil demand stabilizes post COVID. Supply constraints removed over a few years. And Suncor delivers decent free cash flow. You know, if it just hangs out in this 40 to 50 zone. Um, and I think if, as we get stability and as we recover post COVID, this is a scenario, um, you know, it's kind of crazy, but if we just get that, you could easily see Suncor share price at $30, you know, which is up 80% from uh, current levels. So even at the current sort of 40 to $50 oil price, Suncor can do reasonably well. The bear case is, is obviously uh, beneath the $40 level, and that's where things start to get tough for you know, all producers, many producers, and including Suncor. Uh, so here, oil continues to be a pariah politically. Demand does not recover to pre-COVID levels, which was at 100 million a day. Here, really, you know, at a certain point, Suncor may actually pull back on oil sand production. And then they would likely have to make a decision on, you know, what do they do? You know, debt, debt pay down, return cash to shareholders, minim, minimal CapEx, obviously further cost cutting. Um, or do you pivot to green energy? Uh, you know, how do you, around the edges, Suncor is looking at some uh, green and renewable investments, but right now it's around the edges. Do they, do they have to do that more drastically? Um, do the downstream assets still perform? So there's there's lots of questions on the bear side, but really you come out, you know, is there is there still enough value left in the business to uh, that's above and above the current debt level of call it close to twenty billion? So implied share price, I've put a question mark here. I do think that the downside is currently being priced into the stock, um, but there's so many unknowns as to how the management of Suncor would react in a, in a prolonged sort of sub 40 WTI scenario. So let's wrap it up here, concluding thoughts. Suncor's guidance shows cash flow break even, including the dividend uh, at $35 WTI. If you look just back at 2019, uh, Suncor delivered 20% free cash flow yield. Uh, based on the current share price. Now I get it. We're talking, uh, it's a lifetime ago, basically. The integrated business model downstream operations should provide cash flow stability relative to peers. Uh, I believe the downside scenario is largely priced into the stock, uh, but I also recognize the possibility that things could get worse. You could have said this last year. Uh, there are lots of different times where you could have made the argument that the, all of the downside is priced in and the oil and gas sectors found a way to uh, find new lows. I think here as an investor, you do have the potential for 100 to 200% upside from current levels and you get a 5% dividend while you wait. Does not require significant increase to WTI. So as we talked about in our, our base and bull scenarios, we're not, we're not talking about oil going back to 100 here. It wouldn't hurt though. Uh, it does require investors to follow cash flows and not view oil as uninvestable. So I think an important piece of probably the bear case here is, you know, we always think about stocks as the present value of future cash flows, but in certain sectors like tobacco and people are talking about oil in the same vein right now, there is a scenario where even if the cash flows are coming, the stock price may not react exactly as you'd hope. Um, and so I think as an investor, you have to at least be cognizant of that um, and, and have a view on it. And lastly, 
uh, it does require constrained supply, good behavior from the international participants, namely Saudi, Russia. Um, you know, if, if we do continue to uh, get further supply growth here, that's going to be a tough story. So would love to hear your thoughts. That's the video on Suncor. I did initiate a position. I'm, I'm really excited and curious to follow it along. Uh, what do you think? Does the return outweigh the risk here? Is it silly to try and position against the funds flows, which are clearly going out of this sector? Let me know in the comments below. Uh, have a great Thanksgiving weekend. And I'm not even going to say we'll be back shortly with more videos. So we're we're going to be back um, at a certain point in time. Thanks for watching. Happy investing. And don't bury your head in the sand.